thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I too welcome you to Grace Believers Bible Study this morning. Would you turn in your Bible with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3? I'm sorry, make it 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I want to remind you before we read here that uh, what we're doing, we're talking about the church that is referred to in Matthew chapter 16, and I've been trying to show that that church is not the church, which is the body of Christ. Uh, we've talked about the fact that it is basically Jewish, strictly, basically Jewish. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time, back then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was Jewish. The Bible said that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And in Romans chapter 15, verse 8, Paul said that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision confirming the promises made unto the fathers. Yet, the Ephesians, according to Ephesians chapter 2, were not in the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers from the covenants of promise and had no hope and without God in the world. Well, if Jesus Christ is confirming the promises, and if the Ephesians over here were not in those promises, then obviously what he's preaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not include the Ephesians, but that isn't all. If those Ephesians were without hope and without God and were in the promises, then what good would they be? Some way, somehow, you have to make up your mind. So the church there, that makes that, that group that make up that church, of Matthew 16, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. That is the testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that group of people were basically Jewish. Any Gentile that became a part of that, as in First Corinthians, as in Acts chapter 10, blessed the seed of Abraham, worked righteousness, and feared the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's exactly what Peter told him in Acts chapter 10. He said, uh, The Lord has shown me that any man feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And yet the message of the grace of God, the message to the church which is the body of Christ, is exactly the opposite of that. Paul said in, in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us now in 1st Timothy chapter 4 and by the way what, what I'm trying to do I, it, it's very simple I'm just trying to show people that salvation during this dispensation in here is by grace through faith it is not of works, it is without works, and it is, it is based totally and completely upon the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Christ, having died for our sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Your life is out here. If he died for your sins back here, then all of your sins were taken into account when he died. And so Christ died for all of your sins. So if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then all of your sins have been paid for with his death at Calvary. The wages of sin is death. Christ paid the debt. He died for you. So it's a finished thing. It is a done deal. Hence, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But people will not accept that. And the reason they won't accept that is because that down through the years they've been taught that the church, the body of Christ, is back there. Therefore, the doctrine of the church, the body of Christ, is back there, they say. And some of the most fundamental today in order to preserve what they believe is their right to baptize people want to include the body of Christ all the way across back there and especially in the book of Acts. And yet, even though the body of Christ is there 
in a portion of the book of Acts, the doctrine to the body of Christ is not there. And the most fundamental of them who preach and call us dry cleaners and hyper-dispensationalists and Bollingerites and on and on, even they themselves admit that the doctrine to the body of Christ is not back there, but they'll do anything in their power to prove that it is all right to baptize people in water. And that is not our argument here. It doesn't matter to me about you baptizing people. It doesn't matter whether you sprinkle them, pour it on them, put them under the water three times, once in the name of the Father, once in the name of the Son, and once in the name of the Holy Ghost, or if you do it one time in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or if it's face down, or what, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is some preacher out there deceiving people in order to get a crowd so that he can pay for the steeple on top of the building so that he'll have enough income from the crowd that he can pave the parking lot so that he'll have enough money that he can buy himself uh, all sorts of things that cost a lot of money and on and on. That's what gets to me. God Almighty didn't write this book as an instrument to give somebody in Pensacola, Florida, or Mobile, Alabama, the right to pull a con job on people and take their money. It always baffled me that I used to watch a man, a Pentecostalist, a Assembly of God preacher out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that man would walk up and down in front of a camera and speak what he calls speaking in tongues. And yet he would be in some foreign land sometime and have an interpreter. And I thought if the God, the creator of heaven and earth, if the powerful Holy Spirit of God that empowered those in Acts chapter 2 is empowering this man when he's running up and down in there and deceiving the people, talking about speaking in tongues, then why doesn't that same God empower him to speak with the tongues and the languages of the people in those foreign lands? But that isn't all. That man used to be on Channel 3 here in Pensacola. And I understand, understood that uh, he, he was put off there later on because he couldn't pay his bills. And while he was on the air, he would cry great big old crocodile tears and beg people for money and plead for money to stay on the air. Why? This book I got right here, which is a King James Bible, in Philippians chapter 4 says, My God shall provide all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And in 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 he says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work in the Lord. Hence, we believe that. We claim that. And we do not beg you for money. We do not ask you for money. We don't have things to sell you. We don't sell books. We don't sell papers. We don't sell uh, television broadcasts. We don't sell anything. Why? I believe that God Almighty is real. I believe the Holy Spirit is real. I believe that the Spirit of God wrote the words that are in this book I've got here. And the words in this book are the words of the Holy Spirit. And to have the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I must follow the words of this book. Hence, this book said, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth. What is the word of truth? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, there's a reference to trusting Christ. And in verse 
uh, four, uh, verse uh, 12, I believe it is, 13, he said, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What is the word of truth then? By comparing scripture with scripture, the word of truth that must be divided is the gospel of your salvation. It's a doctrine. Well, where do I find the gospel of your salvation? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. Do I find it in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, so forth? No. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In chapter 3, verse 19, he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ. Why, people, you don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be smart to get a hold of that. Just get you a King James Bible and accept what you read at face value. So all we're trying to do is show you the gospel of your salvation. I received a letter in the last few days pertaining to the broadcast that had been made recently, and it's from a woman, and she's presenting some argument. And she's given me all these scriptures that she wants me to check out, trying to prove that that church in Matthew 16 is not what I said. It's not, according to her, what the Bible says. But you know what? People have a real problem, don't they? As in the case of the coming of the Lord. Did you ever notice that there are times, as in Matthew chapter 12, that Jesus Christ refers to the salvation of Gentiles? And yet, the book of Ephesians says that those Ephesians were not in the promises. If in Matthew 12, Jesus Christ promised that he'd save the Ephesians, then they were in the promises, weren't they? Well, then, that reference to Gentiles back there in Matthew and the reference to all the world in John 3.16 is not a reference to the Gentiles in this dispensation which Colossians chapter 1 says was a mystery hid in God from the foundation of the world. This period of time that we're in today is not a part of the history of the Bible. So Paul was given this dispensation, read it in Colossians 1, that he might fulfill the word of God. Fill up the word of God. Romans through Philemon, fill up the word of God. And so... The promise to the Gentiles for salvation is over here. The promise back here, Old Testament promises, all have to do with blessing Israel and going into the kingdom over there as in Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. Now notice in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Notice, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season Reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears And they, apparently the reference to the teachers They shall turn away their ears from the truth And shall be turned unto fables well, people are not preaching the truth today. They're preaching fables. And notice in Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, 
Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. But because there are some of us that these individuals can't deceive, they call us names, as in hypers, as in dry cleaners, as in bulligerites, stamites, moreites, and on and on and on. <laughs> but do you think we care about that? Notice, in Second Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now these words are so specific you can't misunderstand. These are not my words. This is not something that I'm making up. The doctrine shows up over and over. The doctrine, the doctrine, the doctrine, the doctrine. Well, what about the doctrine? Why, there are numerous uh, grace preachers out there that uh, we've been told your problem is you just preach that doctrine all the time. You just preach too much doctrine. Every time I listen, you're involved in doctrine. <laughs> well, that's what the Bible said do. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine. No other than what? Where would I expect to find the doctrine that he's referring to? Well, again, notice in chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, given he to seducing spirits have doctrines of devils. Well, somebody's going to change the doctrine committed to the Apostle Paul, and they're going to teach the doctrine of devils as in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 13, 14, and so forth. The doctrine is very important. Where will I find this? Well, notice in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. That's unmistakable. Where would I find the doctrine? I'd find it in Paul's epistles. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds. Well, Peter preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he preached that Jesus Christ rose from the dead to sit on the throne of David. Paul preached justification by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're different. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, a reference to God, the last word of verse 8, 
verse 9, 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, on and on. Now, if I look at Peter's gospel, I know that the Lord sent him forth to preach the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew chapter 16, uh, uh, chapter 10. Go back to Matthew 10. <coughs> In Matthew 10, verse 5, verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, and again not, but go. Uh, rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as you go say go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand so he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom now I talked to you about the, the last broadcast go to Matthew 16 now he's been preaching the gospel of the kingdom and so verse 21 from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from me, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But wait a minute now. If Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom, and he did, but didn't know that Jesus Christ was going to die and he didn't then obviously the gospel of the kingdom did not include the fact that he was dying for your sins hence 99% of the denominational system today preach Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and preach a salvation of works unto you that listen to them. So I say, but salvation is by grace through faith. And they say, but there's more to it than that. Oh, well, what else is there to it? Well, you have to repent of your sins and confess your sins and be baptized for remission of sins and keep the commandments and endure to the end. They just go on and on and on. What am I hearing? I'm hearing doctrine pertaining to the kingdom not the dispensation of the grace of God so Jesus Christ told the twelve I'm going up there and be crucified I'm going to be raised again from the dead and they didn't believe him in fact not only did they not believe him in the garden of Gethsemane when the people came to arrest Jesus Christ Peter pulled out a sword and began to fight to stop the whole procedure he was not going to permit Jesus Christ to die are you listening if Jesus Christ had not died if Peter would been have would he had permitted to do what he set out to do, you couldn't be saved. Don't you understand? You cannot be saved without Christ died for your sins. The only means of salvation for you is through the death of Jesus Christ dying for your sins, preached by Paul over here. If Peter would have been able to do what he set out to do, as far as he was concerned, you could just end up in hell. Say so we just did it ignorantly. Oh, you agree then. I'm just trying to show you that the gospel of the kingdom does not include Christ dying for your sins. And Peter preached it back there. As if that wasn't enough, notice in Matthew 24. 
<clears throat> in Matthew 24, notice in verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, a man then repents, the baptism of repentance for remission of sins, as John preached, as, Paul, as Peter preached in Acts 2 and on and on. All right, so the man does so. Then what's he going to do? Well, he's got to endure unto the end. In other words, he's got to go all the way. He's got to endure unto death or the second coming of Christ. Now notice in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Well, what do you think Peter believed he was preaching in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. What do you think that he thought it was? Why will people not believe this book? Because they've been brainwashed to believe denominational doctrines. There are two in Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Notice in Luke 24. These two people are on their way home from Jerusalem and Jesus, the resurrected Christ, walks with them and they didn't know him. And so, <clears throat> verse 18, Luke 24, 18, And the, one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou, thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? They said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. What? They believed that Messiah would redeem Israel but they obviously didn't believe it would be done with his death on Calvary they're all sad and upset because he's been crucified so the Lord appeared unto Saul of Tarsus and gave him the gospel he calls it my gospel what is it? that when Christ died at Calvary he died for your sins that he was buried and that he rose again for your justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God will save you. Trust Jesus Christ. Turn your salvation over to him. Commit your salvation to the Lord and say to yourself and to him, if God can't save me by what Christ did at Calvary, there is no hope for me anyway. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just trust him right where you are. Right now, there today, claim him, receive him, believing that he paid for all your sins at Calvary, and God will receive you. Thank you for watching. Until next time, good day.